Rewrite my story. Have you ever come to a point in your life where some obstacle or some event, I don't care, it could be uh, in your finances, it could be in your children, it could be in your career, it could be in church, it could be anything. But have you ever come to a point in your life where you thought, if I can just go back and rewrite this part of my life. Yes, yes. If I can just change the narrative a little bit. Yep. Right? Yep. Now I'm going to start with a little story. And this is a story about a Christian who loved the Lord, sought to serve Him, and desired to live a life filled with God's countless victories that He promised, right? Yes. Promised in His Word, and that's what I'm holding on to. But something was troubling this Christian. And you see, there were promises that were unfulfilled. Desires unmet year after year after year and story by story that seemed to be repeating the same chapter over and over. Yep. Who can relate to that? Amen. But one day this believer in Christ decided to pick up a pen and rewrite the life story from the one that failed to the one that satisfied. Amen. The Christian decided to write the victory story. Being defeated is not fun. Okay. Losing is not fun. Amen. Be, but listen, being defeated is a choice. Oh, that's right. It has not one single iota of event of anything in your life. Oh. Being defeated, being bound, is a choice. Yeah. Now, who is this story about? Anybody know? This story is about you. You, me, us. Right? No matter what your story has looked like thus far, it's never too late to pick up your spiritual pen and change the direction of your life. Right? Because your adversary, that's his job. But what he likes to do is say, hey, Joker, look what's going on. You cannot come into the presence of God tonight. You cannot come into the storehouse and have liberty because don't you know what you said just two days ago? Don't you know uh, whatever you were involved in uh, a day, a week, or whatever the case may be? Yes, I am subject to faults and failures. Yes, I'm subject because I'm a human. My, I be, I'm, my blood bleeds red. I breathe oxygen. I have a mentality. I have a will. I have my own desires. That means I can move in myself from time to time, and I may get it wrong. But guess what? There's one that I can look back to, and he can say, hey, uh, I'm the same God that saved you the first time. I'm the same God that forgave you the first time. All you got to do is pull your feet up under a Holy Ghost table and say, listen up, Jack. Uh, you have no right to use my past against me. You have no right to use yesterday against me. But today I'm walking in the newness and the fullness of God because every day is new and refreshing and His mercy endures to all generations. That's the promise I'm standing on. So listen up, Joker. I'm going to take what's promised uh, versus what you got to say. And I'm going to stand on the promise of His Spirit tonight if that you pop your hands up. Yes. Amen. This is true talk. Yes, it is. Maybe right now your story reads struggles. Financially. You got some type of financial reverse going on. <laughs> Join the crowd. You're in good company. Right? That's right. Blame the puppet up on the Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue for that. Oh, boy. Suffers with poor relationships. Lives with unfulfilled desires. This list could go on and on and on. Yeah, Write it in there yourself, whatever the case may be. But when you learn how to rewrite your story, it will be one of, that reads this. Financially prosperous. Yes. Enjoys happy relationships. Mm -hmm. And has received my heart's desires. Yeah. Right? right? I can honestly say, I, I've lived a pretty fulfilled life. I've done a lot. I've done a lot of things in life. Yep. 
I mean, did I do everything I wanted to do? Probably not. But if I were to go to glory tomorrow, I can say I had a fulfilled life. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. Why? I've never really wanted for anything. Nope. There's a difference. Do you catch what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I have never went without what I needed. Right? Yeah. I may not have had, always had what I wanted. Right. But I had what I needed. That's right. Right? Amen. Amen. Here's the most important thing. Why is my life fulfilled? Because there was a moment in time where I came to an altar of sacrifice. And my only regret in life is that I waited as long as I did. Amen. Why? Because it was everything before then. Yeah, I'd like to rewrite a few of those. Yeah. Right? Amen. But I can honestly... <laughs> I have never... And you're going to get this. Hopefully you get this. I've never seen a Christian that was sorry for that decision. Amen. Right. Amen. That's true. I've seen a few sorry Christians. <laughs> but I've never seen a Christian sorry for that action. Amen. Because that's the most rewarding event in my Amen. lifetime. Yes. Amen. Because that's the one facet that no matter what you do to me, no matter how you talk about me, no matter what you say about me, no matter what they come at me against, no matter what they try to take my possessions, my car, my house, whatever the case may be, there's one thing that I cannot be stripped of. And that is the royal blood of Emmanuel that flows through my life and through my veins. You can't take another thing from me. You can't take what's on schedule for me to receive. I am blessed beyond measure. Yes. No matter what happens from here, because this is just temporal, but that is eternal. Yes. Right? Yes. So I have the right and I have the option and I have the ability to rewrite my story. Amen. Right? And if you know of those individuals that like to stay down in gloom and defeated and all that, they have that right to do so. You have that right. Yep. You ever met somebody who wasn't happy unless they were unhappy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Every, every, everybody in this room could say yes to this. Yes. I, I know it for a fact. Everybody knows an individual. Somebody you could work with, go to school with, something like that. How you doing? I'm not. <laughs> you know why? Jerry's here tonight. Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's just an illustration, but you get it. They'll use anything as a catalyst for their mood Amen. or their agenda. Or whatever the case may be. Right? You ever heard this? Misery loves company. They're not happy unless they're bringing you to their level. Say, no, 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 no. I've got my spiritual pen out tonight. And it's got an eraser on the other end of it. And here's what I'm going to do. Since I want to be over... Uh, I'm erasing your negativity. Your lackluster attitude. Your unwillingness, I'm erasing all of the negative about whatever it is you're going on with right now out of my story. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. Yeah. Because I don't want that in my life. Right. I don't want that negative. It's depressing enough to, to go through life. I don't need you helping me on the journey. Amen. Right? That's right? That's one thing I don't need help with. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to turn the page and I'm going to start writing the next narrative. Amen. Amen. And you know what it says? You know what it says? What does it say? It says this. I am bought with the blood. That's right. The price has been paid. Hold on, there's another one. Comma. <laughs> Devil. Take notice. Take notice. <laughs> you 
have no authority. Amen. Amen. You know, mm, this just hit me. You know what you need that some people need to do within the church house? Quit blaming the devil for everything that That's you get right. involved in. Amen. What you need to do is this. You need to say, listen, I'm tired of like the, mm, I got to get in this a minute. I got to push it. Uh, oh, well, here we go. We go ahead twice. Quit playing the blame game, right? And say, look, it's just like my parents. My, your, my parents, I'll use mine so I don't get in trouble. I, you know what? I, I couldn't blame my mom and dad. A lot of kids do. But I can never blame my mom and dad for what I got in love, you know. Right. I just had to say from time to time, I'm a bonehead. I did it. I own it. Yeah. Right? It ain't their fault. They did their best to steer me away from it. Right. Woo! <laughs> yes, duck in the book trying to steer you away from it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. That's when you start rewriting your negativity in your story. Yeah. Right? Okay, I gotta go on. I gotta go. I gotta go. Because I'm coming back to something there and I don't want to mess it up. You see, listen, you have been get, you've been given the right by Almighty God Himself to write your own story. Amen. Nobody can write it but you. Amen. Nobody puts you in jail but you. Amen. Nobody gets you dependent on something else but you. Amen. Right? Yep. Somebody tell me the other day, uh, you gotta have compassion and mercy and all that. Well, I do. I pray for them, stuff like that. But let's get down to brass tacks. I didn't give it to them. That's right, that's right. Right? It was a conscious decision. And until somebody makes another conscious decision, you're spinning your wheels. Right? While he has a calling for your life and a plan and a purpose, which he does for everybody in here, you get to choose whether to walk in that plan or not. It's your choice. If you choose God's way, he has a life of victory, prosperity, that's already been ordained and prepared for you. That's why Jesus came. That's the, that's the whole premise of why he came. Amen. Was to give you life. Right? Are you ready to see a twist in your own plot here? Are you ready? Here are, I'm going to give you three ways to rewrite your story and to change your life. A crucial part of the Christian experience is believing that God can change your story or rewrite it. You understand that? That's a crucial experience. Because you don't have to live in the same quagmire. He's going to lift you out of it. A rewrite is more than a cliche or a temporary behavior modification or a goose bump, if you will. It's a permanent and inspirational change that will carry you from here to glory. And it begins when we decide to focus our attention on God and embrace what he wants to do specifically for our individual lives. Right? Uh, when they prayed for revival, Jerry, in the book of Nehemiah, you'll read where it says, They read, they worshipped, they stood, right? And they confessed. I think it's in chapter 9. That was about revival for the church. But did you notice the terminology? They read. They didn't, they didn't do it about their neighbor. They didn't do it about somebody in the pew in front of them or behind them. Each individual took responsibility for themselves. That's right. Right? That's right? That's the cruel thing. Now listen, before we can experience a rewrite, we've got to ask ourselves three questions. You ready? ready. Three questions. Number one, do I believe in change? Do you? Yeah. Or do you like the status quo? Who likes living in the status quo? I can do that if you want. Okay, since nobody's into this, here's what I'm going to do. I'll go with the status quo. I'll come up here. I'll stand at this podium. And I'll give you a lecture. You, you want that? No, no. That's a status quo. I can do that every week. Whatever, I didn't hear that, but whatever it is, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Would you all want that? No. That's the status quo. Come in, give you three points of poem, pray. <coughs> Go on. I couldn't do that. I tried that once here and it didn't work out. <laughs> Second thing is, do I believe people can change? Yes. Can they? Absolutely. Yes. 
I will tell that I'll be in that in a minute. People can change, but people cannot change themselves. It takes God and God alone to change the heart of an individual. Lastly, do I believe I can change? <coughs> That's a big one. In order for God to rewrite our story, we must embrace a life of change. And I'm talking about perpetual change. We should be changing daily. It just doesn't change at the altar because it's an everyday event. That's right. Right? Because every day I'm changing because I'm being molded. Right? So if I'm being molded by the master potter, that means I'm not, woo, this just hit me. I'm not going to keep the same shape. I'm not going to keep the same way. I'm not going to keep the same. Do you ever hear this? Some of you older ones in here, wiser ones, when we were growing up in church, do you ever remember Sister Betty Lou will say that? Betty Lou, that gave the same testimony every Sunday. You remember that? My God, I think. How many times do you get saved for the same thing? Jerry. Why do you keep doing the same thing? Right? All of a sudden, your testimony should be changing daily. Because your experience is changing daily. Yes. And your relationship is changing daily. When you uh, meet, you start dating someone, at first it's a little quirky and awkward. You're getting to know each other, each other's likes, dislikes, all that stuff. But as you progress, what happens? You become unified. Right? Uh, you know what makes them tick. Terry. Terry knows what makes me tick. Terry knows what makes me explode. Terry can push that ignition faster than anybody on the planet, right? But you know what I'm talking about. You that are married, you know what I'm talking about. Why? Because they're the closest to you. They know you. They can read you like a book, right? Now, let me ask you something. We're in a relationship, are we not? So shouldn't you do the same thing in your earthly relationship as you do in your spiritual one? To where every day that you're communicating... Every day that you're in, you become bonded. Yes. Right? That's good stuff. That preach. Yes. Right? All right. Let me go on before I get to meddling. I'm helping. Listen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. What's the Bible say? It says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight the sin which doeth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the Arthur. What's the title of this message? Rewrite my story. He's the Arthur and the finisher of our faith. That tells me this. He wrote it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Hmm. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the promise. Bless this in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. God is the author of our story. And therefore, he is the one who can rewrite it. Amen. This tells me this. When somebody looks at you and says you're hopeless. When somebody looks at you and says you've gone too far. You've crossed the line that cannot be redrawn. All you've got to do is say that's your opinion. That's right. But the author of my story says he can rewrite anything. Yes. And if he can rewrite it upon the tablet of my heart, who are you to say God cannot move? Right? Now, here's the thing. The scripture also says that no one can run the race God marks out for them without first being set free from sin. Right? You can't run a spiritual race if you're not free. Right. right? Now we have three enemies of these rewrites. Did you know? 
tell you something. No matter how cute you think you are, they might think they're cute. Yes. Somebody, somebody lied to you. Put your hand down. <laughs> no matter how cute you think you are, no matter how talented you think you are, no matter how good you think you are at what you do, somebody, somewhere, somehow, somewhere is out to tear you down. Yeah. Amen. It's that simple. Sad. And you got enemies. There's three enemies in these rewrites. Three sins that will kill our rewrite. Are you ready for them? Yes. Pride, bitterness, and unbelief. Amen. Number one, pride. Obadiah 1, 3 says this, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, that thou dwellest in the cliffs of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Pride creates an identity crisis. <coughs> Understand that? Amen. Why? There's a battle between who you think you are and what the Bible says you are. Amen. Amen. There's a big difference in the middle there. Pride makes us think we're able to do things by ourselves. I'll be the first to tell you I can't do nothing. I can't do nothing without the leading of the Spirit. Yeah. Jerry, I don't care how good that I study something out, write it down, type it out, read it three or four times, recite it in a mirror, and preach to my wall before I preach to you. I could not come up here and be effective without the power and the anointing of God behind it. It's that simple. Because I'm nothing in myself. You are nothing in yourself. We, we're, we are, are insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Amen. Right? Amen. Yes. But listen. As a result, we get stuck in the sand sometimes. Right? In a standstill. We can actually change. And we feel frustrated because it's our mood. It's whatever's going on at the time. You can, I've watched people in this church do it. You walk through the door, you're giddy, happy, and all of that. You sit down, yapping with each other, and talking, having a good time. I come up here and I say something, and <laughs> here's how they go out the door. <laughs> I've seen it. I've watched it. Why? Hey, me anyway. I didn't write this thing. Right? I'm not the author. If you got a problem, look up, take it up there. Right? That's good stuff. That'll preach, Jerry. Amen. You got that? Amen. So what's the solution to pride? Take a look at this scripture. Romans chapter 12 verse 3. What's it say? For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What's that mean? That keeps grounded right there. What that means is this. I am no greater of a pastor or preacher than anybody else. Right? I'm no better of a singer than anybody else. Yeah. I'm no better at my job than anybody. Why? Because I've got the ability that was given to me in the first place. It wasn't mine. Amen. Right? Amen. Which means I can't exalt myself. I can't think I'm all that because he gave it to me. Amen. Right? Before you can experience a rewrite, you have to admit through the truth of who you really are. Amen. This doesn't have to be discouraging. Uh, if you're honest with yourself, the more you can be grateful for how much faith God has placed in you, how much God has already given you, how much He's already anointed, until you're faithful with what, mm, until you're faithful with what He's already given you, don't pray for something greater on the other side if you're not faithful for what you already have. Right? There you go. Number two, bitterness. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. Anybody ever experienced it? Yeah. Don't point. Yeah. 
when it comes to stuff like this, Tina, you know what I do sometimes? I go in my office and I do this. So listen. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> right? I do that from time to time. And I have conversations. Ask Terry, she'll tell you, I talk to myself all the time. All the time. You know, I was told when I took psychology and sociology in college, you know what they told me? It's okay to do that as long as you don't answer. Mm. I failed. <laughs> because I, you know, I, I say to myself, I do it all the time. I say, self, mm. <laughs> And then I ask, you ever asked yourself a question and then answered it? <laughs> and then you think to yourself, who am I talking to? Right? It happens. <laughs> Bitterness. Bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15, what's it say? Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, which we all have done, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Let me repeat that. See that little semicolon after God? Yeah. All right, now catch the next one. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. That means you're giving it the power, the fuel, yeah. to trouble you. Yeah. That's what that means. Because nobody can hurt you with what they say. All they do is, at some point in time, somebody's going to say something about you. It's that, it, I don't care who it is, but somebody's going to talk about you. You're going to make somebody mad, right? Everybody ain't going to love you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm going to say something that some people might not agree with, but it's true because I've actually physically heard this, so out here. All right? I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm glad you were here today. It's good to see you again. God, they suck. Yep. Absolutely. That's the word I heard. That is That's why I said that. Are you picking up on this? Yep. You picking up on what I'm throwing? Yep. Yep. You can't be, you can't do that. Nope. Nope. Why? Nope. Because you cannot have the spirit of rejoicing at the same time as a spirit Amen. of destruction. Amen. 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 They cannot coincide together. That's right. It's enmity with God. And what does the Bible say? He won't have nothing to do with it. Amen. Right? Absolutely. We on the road here? Everybody on the same road? Amen. We okay? Amen. Nobody needs CPR, do they? Nope. We'll, <laughs> nobody fall on the floor, we'll scare Peggy. All right? <laughs> Hold on. Time. Pause. Let's push the pause button. Oh, no. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I'll do it. The Freemans are here Sunday, so I can't do it then. The following Sunday, I am going to give you a video presentation. I am going to do that. For those of you that were at the festival, you will know what I'm talking about. Our tent was here. There's a 90 degree, degree hill like this. And Peggy had to get to her car. <laughs> so Peggy gets an exciting thought, and I thought she had done lost her marbles. But so what we did, she goes, yeah, instead of walking all the way around down the steps, all she goes, let's just go down the hill. And I looked at her like I was stuck on stupid. And I went, there ain't no way. We, there's no way we're walking down. The, it's a 90 degree hill. It's like this. So Peggy, in her ingenuity of mind, gets some cardboard, <laughs> puts it under her keister, and says, we're going to go down this hill like this. She has me, Eric, and Dylan going with her. Now here's what happens. On this hill, I'm in a pair of hey dude shoes. I, my ankle is twisting, breaking, and everything, trying to keep her from staying above 90 or under 90 going down this hill. So finally, it was funny. Oh, it ain't not like watching. I am going to play this. So the whole church will see it. It's a Peggy Chronicle that you do not want to miss. Extra special edition. <laughs> 
Alright? And what happened was, I had this leg, Eric had that leg, but only Eric went faster than me. I went slower than Eric. So one went this way, one went that way, and she went down the middle. And then the cardboard moved. Then it was somersaults. <laughs> Literally rolling down this hill. And I had to get down there because I thought if she gets there before I do, she's going to face plant on that sidewalk. So I, I sacrificed my ankle. Eric sacrifices his back and everything else, right? We get down there and we plant. So she goes... <laughs> Now let me tell you something. Not me. Oh, you thought it was a good idea. You got there, didn't you? I did. All right. Did you have fun? I had blast. Michael, can we have the video of Terry too? I think it's on the same video. We may eliminate that part. Yeah. 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 Yeah
All of a sudden, this, uh, what, what was she, 12 years old, I believe the Bible says. She was 12 years old. And all of a sudden, they came in and the people were thronging on every side, every direction. And all of a sudden, would you believe nothing's changed, Jerry, from then till today? Because there's people that are coming to this tabernacle as we're praying heaven now for, and believing for a miracle. God can't do it. He's not going to do that. I don't need you in around here. And that's the problem. Amen. Amen. Why? Somebody says, do you believe in putting people out of the church? Jesus did. Yes, he did. Right. Jesus did. What are you talking about? He turned around. He told them. He said, Peter, James, and John, and the father of that little girl, you guys come with me. Everybody else, kick rocks. I don't need you here. Why? Because you're filled with doubt, fear, and unbelief. Amen. That's what he said. He, but in essence, this is what he did. He said, I come for a mission. I come for a purpose. I didn't come here to predicate. I didn't come here to talk. I didn't come here to go through the motions. There's a miracle in the balance. And I'm the one that can get the job done. I came here with a purpose. And unless you join with me on that purpose, find somewhere else to go. That's what he said. And I like that. If you read on in that story, when he gets up there, he says, Talitha Kumi. Which being interpreted means, daughter arise. Right? And all of a sudden, guess what happened? Now here's the thing. Can you imagine this in your mind's eye? What are you doing calling Jesus? You don't need uh, that Jewish scribe. You don't need him. He's just a carpenter from Galilee. What if you need to call the undertaker. You need the funeral. The, her blood has already gone to her feet. Her heart has already stopped. And you're calling on that guy? Yes. Amen. Get the funeral clothes ready. And all of a sudden, I can hear Jesus in my spiritual tone right here. He's saying, mm, the funeral's over. Amen. Because I've rewrote the story. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Right? Yes, what are you talking about? And then he said, they even hired mourners. The Bible says that the tumult, the, the tumult, they hired those people that they hired to mourn for the loss of the people. They're out there singing a bunch of songs and mourning and crying at their loss. And all of a sudden, they're getting ready to have a revival up in the bedroom. Yeah. Why? Because the narrative had been rewritten. When the circumstance says it's over, God says, That's right. it's not over until I say it's over. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. She can't live anymore. She's already dead. Thank you, Father. <laughs> you don't understand. Thank you, Jesus. That's right. I am. Hallelujah. Yes. That's right. Thank you, Father. Yes, he is. Yes. I am. Just like Mary, Mary Ma, all of a sudden, when she was talking to Jesus and said, yes, uh, when it was regarding Lazarus, and she said, yes, uh, I know he'll live again in that great day of the resurrection. And he said, I am Amen. the resurrection. Amen. Amen. Yep. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, that's good stuff. Yes, yes. And don't you know it's that same one, Jerry, yes. that's coming into GBC? Uh, you're out here tonight uh, on a Sunday night service uh, that says, I am the resurrection. I, uh, I don't care what your circumstance is. Uh, I don't care what your problem looks like. Uh, I don't care what the medical report says. Uh, I don't care what the theologian says. I don't even care what the pastor said. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Then all of a sudden, here's what you need. You know, it's like this. He's, he's posing the question. You know, you people that run your mouth all the time uh, about how you want God to do, how God ought to be, how he ought to move. How can he do it if it doesn't matter to you enough to even show up in the presence of God? There are people that will use more excuses as to why it can't versus why they don't do it themselves. I'm not making this up. Right. 
I'm not. Right? We'll complain. God is saying this. He told us, how bad do you want it? You say with your lip service. Jerry, I am sold out to believe that most of the church world today is long on promise and short on deliverance. Amen. Right? Because we say we want the moving of God. But we don't, let's, we don't even participate in the moving of God. Right? Mm. I need to go to the whole business meeting, Jerry, and let me out of here. <laughs> Mark 6, 5 and 6. What's it say? And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Jesus actually couldn't do any miracle among people who were unbelieving. That's right. It's impossible. That's right? right? Yeah. That's why he always put, who do they say I am? Well, some say you're Elias. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. No. Who do you right. say I am? Amen. He's posing the same question to you and I tonight. I don't care what the Southern Baptist Convention says that I am in their bylaws and their constitution and their agenda. What do you say I am? I don't care what the Catholics say. I don't care what the Pentecostals say. I care about what you say. Amen. Right? That's right. Mm, that's good stuff. Yes. Why do you talk about he can't move on anybody unbelieving? I just told you that, right? Why? Why do you think that when he come down through the roof, Right? You remember this story? Yes. What happened? He did. But what happened first? He was saved first. That's right. I can't heal you until I can't heal you till I heal you. That's right. <laughs> you like that? Amen. Mm -hmm. Right? Why? Because here's the thing. Unless we're right. You cannot have a passport to live willy-nilly and do whatever you want to do Monday through Saturday and expect the miracles and manifestation of God on Sunday. It don't work that way. Right? What are you talking about? You can't dance block bop a loop bop on Saturday and dance in the Holy Ghost on Sunday. It cannot be done. Right? I got more. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's called an imitation. I got a sermon coming out of that called Camouflage Christians. That's coming up probably next month, so get ready for that one. Huh. <laughs> that might be one you want to skip. I don't know. But... I know. <laughs> I keep telling people that. Listen to this. What areas of unbelief do you need to deal with in your relationship with God? This takes it down to the nitty gritty. Don't, I'm going to ask you about who you're sitting in the pew with. Your husband, wife, whoever. You. What area do you need to deal with? Are you a blamer? I mentioned this earlier. Why? How do you know that these three sins are controlling your life? You become a blamer. Everything is someone else's fault. You approach life with a victim mentality instead of taking ownership and responsibility. Blaming sometimes feels easier in the moment. But to have a rewrite, we need to take responsibility. Right? We can no longer blame other people or our circumstances. Remember when I said everybody likes to blame the devil for something? Listen, the devil did not make you have that hot toddy. That's right. Right. Amen. The devil did not make you gossip about your church member. Amen. 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 The devil did not make you take drugs. Amen. The devil did not make you stay home in bed and miss the church Amen. service. Amen. All of those are self inflicted. Yes, they are. Right? It's taking responsibility. Amen. Right? 
I, I, I called my sister today. She, is this going on? Yeah. Is she on it? No. Okay. I talked to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? And I asked my sister, hey, where was you today? Her answer to me was, honestly, I just overslept. And she said, I know it's a lame excuse. But you know what today was? She didn't tell me she had something to do. That's right. She flat out told me I overslept, I was tired. And then she goes, I know it's, it's a bum excuse, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. That's taking responsibility. That's right? right? Mm -hmm. She said, I just didn't get up. I laid there and slept. She said, I watched it later, though. I did watch it. I was like, oh, kudos, thank you. <laughs> but she took the responsibility. Now, that's what I'm talking about. She could have said, well, I had a doctor's appointment. On Sunday, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> but she did tell me the truth. Now, listen. Listen carefully. We can't always control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond. Yeah. How you respond to challenges Let's look at a man in the Bible who took responsibility and had faith in the midst of a challenging circumstance. And instead of blaming God or others around him, guess what he did? He looked at himself. So I gave you the three enemies, right? Now I'm going to give you the three keys to rewrite your narrative, your story. It's only five after seven. I think I got time to do it. This is where you say yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yes, Pastor. Let's learn from Abraham. Want to go there, Jerry? Sure. Abraham allowed God to rewrite his story. Truly appreciate and respect. We need to do this. But in order to do it, we need to respect and appreciate Abraham's story. Think about something you've, done, you've been waiting for. Y'all been, has anybody here waited on something? I know me every day. I wait on the Amazon truck to leave my house. <laughs> I used it. For a long time, every day, I hear, and I hear, you know how I know they're there? Boomer gets bipolar. We wait for things all the time. We wait for the right guy or the right girl or a baby, a job promotion or a number of myriad of other things. Abraham waited until he was 75 for God to promise him a child. Why? I do not know. I'm 50 and I ain't waiting on that promise. Too late in the game. <laughs> And then 25 more years for the baby to be born. Yeah. After God told him he would have one. Sure. Now he waited for 75 for the promise and waited 25 more to receive the promise. I you the <laughs> Some of us have a problem for an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I felt a cool breeze blow in right there. <laughs> it's the truth. We have a problem for an hour that because generally 10.30, I try to get you out by 12. 6, I try to get you out by 7.30, quarter to 8. Right? But some people can't even wait that long. Right? That's a lot of waiting. What is that? 75, 7, 8, 9. That's 100 years. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes, I did the math. Thank you. What happens to us when we wait for a long time? We often get what? Bitter, proud, unbelieving, instead of remaining faithful like Abraham. That's right. So let's look at these three keys to rewrite. Taken from the life of Abraham. You ready? Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 6. This is what it said. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eli Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. God promised him a son in the next couple of verses. All right? 
And he brought forth a board and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said to them, So shall thy seed be. Now, where we get this at is this. You, now, you know Abraham, Father Abraham, right? The father of generations. Everybody, you and me, this is where this comes from, right? So shall thy seed be. Abraham was justified by what? Faith. Faith. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now from this scripture, Jerry, and everybody else, we can find three keys to letting God rewrite our story. And here they are. Number one, fear. Admitting it. Abraham was afraid that he wouldn't get what he really wanted. Instead of stuffing this inside and pretending he didn't really want a kid, he was honest with God, was he not? With what his fear, what he really wanted. And he was honest. What fears do you need to express to God? I'll tell you one of them right off the bat. I already know as a pastor, I already know this. There's people that want a deeper relationship with God, but they're afraid of what God's going to require of them to do. Yeah. Right? I cannot get more involved in that GBC bunch because I, that pastor Mike, he's a fruitcake. And I know he's going to come over there. He's going to ask me something. He's going to get me up in front of people. He's going to talk directly to me. He's going to ask me to do something. I can't, I can't do that. I got, to, I got to sit there in my little shell. Fear. There's, hey, I, I'm going to say that they ain't here. That's on them. They, your husband and his brother. They're two big boys. But they'll shake like a leaf if I look their direction and they think I'm going to ask them something. They do. Yep. Am I telling the truth? Why? Why? I don't know. But it, I, it does keep them from being to their full potential. Yes. It does keep them from going limitless with God. Right? And that's something I can't fix. That's something they got to deal with. Yeah. Right? But fear will stop... Fear will stop the blessing. Amen. Fear will stop the moving of the Spirit. What are you talking about? If God tells you to move, move. Amen. If God tells you to go pray for somebody, go pray for them. That's right. Amen. Well, the pastor get past me. Don't get upset. Did I get upset with her today when she went back out? No. Did I stand there and wait for her to do it? Yeah, why? Because it's not my place to stop that. That's right. Right? If God told you to move, move. Because if God told you to do it, it's going to be in order. Yes. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. I, in my pastoral life, have only set one person down. Mm -hmm. One. And that's because I was in the middle of doing something, and they started speaking in tongues and doing all this stuff. And you say, Pastor, is that name? No. God does not anoint two people to talk Amen. at the same time. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. That's confusion. Right? That's only happened once. Thank God. Don't, don't, don't make do that here because I don't do it again. Why does everybody wonder who the next one's going to be? Is that it? Everybody just sit there and stood. I don't know what am I supposed to do. They're all looking at me. <laughs> So Kay goes over there and prays for somebody. She prays for death. Here it is. Fear. Pastor Mike. I almost shouted a little bit in the night. <laughs> Why didn't you? Right. I was worried about what they would think about me. Okay, right. They ain't going to think about anything about you. Right. They'll probably wish they were you. That's right. I wish I could receive a blessing like that. Right. Get up and get it! Amen. Amen. Right? I did hear this one. Thank God. I'm glad she went over there and prayed for her tonight because it set this kind of tone right here. Well, I was going to go pray for her tonight, but I wasn't sure if I was supposed to. I didn't know if I was in the spirit. Who do you think is telling you to pray for her? I can tell you with a surety it ain't the enemy. Here's your sign. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. I 
mean, sometimes when I'm dealing with people on that level, so I, I play and I think, good Lord. When you think the devil with his pitchfork is standing over there on your shoulder, hey, go pray for her. <laughs> but what does that do? That quenches the spirit. And the Bible in Thessalonians tells us, quench not the spirit. Right? So all of a sudden now, here's what happens. I'll, I'll back this up a little bit. Kay could have been up here on the pulpit with the praise team saying, my responsibility is to do this at the moment. God, uh, you have to call somebody else because I'm doing what you had me supposedly to do. So go tell, go tell Peggy to go up there. What's that do? All of a sudden now, she acted out of herself. She misses her healing. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't call Peggy. I called you. I've anointed you to move in my stead upon her body. Nobody can do it but you. Now, if you're telling me that you don't believe that I can do it, if you're telling me that I'm not who I say I am, fearful. Be fearful there. Right? Then what we're doing is this, and it's a fearful thing to do, because we're telling God he's a liar, and we're putting him back on the cross. Right? Hmm. That's good stuff. Let me finish quickly, quickly, quickly. Number two. Flexibility. How, how flexible are you? Peggy, how flexible are you? <laughs> Flexibility. Abram, Abraham, he made a shift in how he thought about God. It wasn't just about who he could uh, about what he could get from God anymore, was it? Because all of us just come to God for the tangible things, yeah. right? But it wasn't about that. He decided to trust God and to serve Him, even if it meant not having kids in His timeline mm -hmm. or His lifetime, mm -hmm. right? I, what? Where's that come from? Flexibility. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye may be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of yes. God. It don't get no more flexible than that. What that means is you flow as he leads. You move where he says move. You go where he says go. You sing, get this. You sing what he says to sing. Amen. You preach what he says to preach. I have had times before, Jerry, when I've been invited to preach at different places, and I've walked up the podium, and what I knew I was, I did not want to do it. I knew who was out here. I knew the crowd I was dealing with. God, you cannot preach, you cannot tell me to preach on this. You can't do it. I won't. You will. I did. <laughs> walked in there one night, Jerry walked into a state convention with the Baptist one time, come in. Preach on the Holy Ghost. I ain't no way. Ain't doing it. I said, God, do you know where I'm at? I'm in the Deep South Bible Belt. I'm in the Baptist buck, belt buckle. I ain't doing it. You'll do what I tell you to do. Ain't doing it. So I'm thumbing through my Bible. I'm looking for another sermon. I'm sitting on the pulpit. Waiting on my name to be introduced to walk up here. I'm getting ready to talk in front of a couple hundred people here. All right? It's, it's a state convention. Revival. Can't do it. I said, God, I drove 12 hours to be here tonight. Not to get back in my car and drive back home. Mm -hmm. 
I said, I can't do it. I, I, I'm looking through another sermon. You know what happened? I walked up. Pastor, Pastor Mike Brandenburg from Cincinnati, Ohio. We brought him down here to preach this camp meeting and all this stuff. I walked from there to there. I stood right there. And I couldn't even talk. Couldn't even talk. My eyes were down again. <laughs> 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 you, ever, you know what I mean? You ever, I couldn't even talk. And I thought, I've never, I'm usually never at a loss for words. I can usually come up with something. All of a sudden, amen. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I probably got about five, six hundred people staring at me. What do you do? So I, the best thing I, I only do one way to recover. You know what's coming, right? Lord, I, I, excuse me, I need a moment with God. <laughs> and I go into praise, thinking, hoping that they join me on this little crusade, right? And then you have this little sanctimony. I told you sometimes I'm schizophrenic, right? I'm having a couple <laughs> conversations. I'm having one with you. I'm having one with God. And I'm thinking about what I'm doing. You know, but it works. <laughs> then all of a sudden, God says, you ready to preach? I have a choice. <laughs> no. <laughs> See, I told you, it's good to be off talking to myself, right? Talking to me, God. Go back out there, preach on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know what happened? Do you want to know what happened? Yes. At the end of this service, there was probably about 150 people in the altar. Amen. 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 <laughs> the music director was face planted on the pulpit Amen. in the spirit. Amen. Five deacons got saved. And the pastor jumps up. And I love this, Jerry. You ready for this? This is what we've been praying for. This is what we've been longing for. What is it? Jump out of your comfort zone. Be flexible. Be ready to move with the Spirit of God. Because there's a couple hundred people there that probably would have never experienced the fullness of God if I would have been arguing with God. Well, I wouldn't have been able to. I would have had to walk out the door because I would know. Right? Couldn't even do nothing. God will get your attention. And he will remind you you're not in control. Amen. Right? That's right. Mm, that's good stuff. All right, let's go on. Do you let God change your thinking? Or do you try to change yourself to think more like what the world does around you? Here's the problem with what I've got here. We as the church have changed our priorities to fit the masses. This is what we've done. We have said we'll allow so much of this because if we don't, it becomes offensive. But let me let you in on a secret. That's what the Word does. Right. The Word is offensive. Right. Because it forces you to make a decision. Right? right. right? I'm either going to do it this way or this way. Because there is no middle ground here. Amen. Right? Amen. I can't be condoning this and going over here and doing this. Right? Amen. That would be like me letting... Anybody and their mother's brother come in here and do whatever they want. You can't do that. When I'm not here, it's already been prayed over, thought out. Who's up here? Why? You want to know why? Because what comes from here is my responsibility. And if somebody misses the mark because some joker says the wrong thing, guess who answers for it? Right? You cannot be compromising. You know for a fact. There's certain people I've known all my life. I have never invited them here. There's a reason for that. Right? 
Because it, this should be the most guarded place on the planet. Right? Because there are eternal values and dangers. Right? Flexibility. Be flexible. Now, you don't have to go down a hill on cardboard and prove that, but I'm just saying. Number three. You ready for this? Faith. After he admitted his fears and changed his thinking, Abraham made a decision to believe God's promise about his destiny for him. For him. Do you believe your emotions more than what you, God says in the Bible? I'll just add yes. Say yes. yes. Because there. Now you don't have to pray about lying. You told the truth. It's, it's the truth. Everybody in here has done that. Why? I ain't going to church tonight. I don't feel good. I ain't going to church tonight. Super Bowl something. I ain't going to church tonight. Because I'm mad at her. Why? Because she didn't give my bowl back at the church dinner 35 years ago. <laughs> sure. That does happen. <laughs> does happen. That pastor, he didn't shake my hand after service. Yep. <laughs> yep. I probably didn't get to you to shake your hand, not necessarily you, but I was probably in the middle of making sure somebody was safe. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's important. I was probably making sure that I greeted them and made sure they felt welcome. That's right. Right? I can deal with you anytime I want. That's right. I can deal with you anytime I want. That's right. I deal with you every day. I love y'all. But that's how it is, right? Right? Excuses. That's all they are. Why do you say that? Because here it is. I'm going to be as blunt as I possibly can. There is nothing more that irritates the fire out of me than somebody telling me I was going to be there but I didn't feel good. That, that is the number one, I, I cannot, why? Because it's the hurting that ought to be in the presence of God. It's the sick that ought to be in the house of God. That's right? Amen. right? Yep. Amen. Does the Bible say that they'll know that you're my disciples? Did he not give us a commission and mandate? Jerry, is this in the word where he says that you should go about laying hands on the sick and they shall recover? Amen. Is that not a direct mandate? Yes, it is. Amen. Okay, so where do we get the print of that? I can feel better in my bed than I can in the presence. No way. Then lay there, baby. You can lay there and yep. be sick all you want. Yep. Not me. Hold on. I'm coming into the house of God. Here's what I'm going to do. I may be sick, but I'm going to church tonight. So when I get that, oh. <laughs> <laughs> know what I'm saying? I'll blow my nose, I'll wipe my eyes, I'll do whatever I gotta do, but I'm gonna be in the presence of God. Yeah. Right? I could have did that myself. Yeah, I thought about that. Can I do this? Yeah, why not? Well, so, you know, as you know, we were down south and I got a sunburn. So I took my shirt off last night. I was changing after we got back because I was going to take a shower after being out there all, you know, you feel gritty. I took my shirt off and where I got massively burned. As you know, this stuff peels. I look like shredded cheese. <laughs> I, I, I looked in the mirror in the room and I thought, ew. <laughs> And I, I told Terry, have you ever seen something so disgusting that you had to get somebody else to verify it? <laughs> right? 
So I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm looking like this, and these string things just hang on. And I'm thinking, Terry, do something about this. What do you want me to do? It? Get a cheese grater. I don't care. You know what I mean? But it's, it was gross and disgusting, right? I could say, what would you do if I said, I go in the morning because I look like a tread of cheese? Well, yeah, what happens if I, one day I may do that. No, I'm Terry, I'm going there, I can't find my teeth. <laughs> They're in the chair. Huh? They're in the chair. <laughs> we need to stop using excuses. That's right. What do you think would happen if the church, us, since I'm responsible for this one, GBC, if we put as much effort into our motivation as we did our excuses, that's right. That's right. What do you think would take place? True. You'd have an all-out building wash. Yes. We could get this building done because there'd be more people here. We'd be more people would be more faithful in their tithes and giving and stuff. If you want to know the truth, somebody's asked me the other day why I haven't done anything with it. Want to know the truth? I'll tell you. Pay your tithes. Right. Yeah. I've done everything I can do. They're waiting on me to say go. I can't say go till you all are faithful. That's, that's as blunt as I can be. Right? That's right. Say yes. 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 There we go. I got that one out of my chest. Where am I at? Thank you. <laughs> so when God told Abraham that he would give him a son, and he would have many descendants and become a great nation. Abraham believed God, and even though such a promise was such huge, he thought it couldn't come to pass in the beginning. And because his faith was strong, he didn't worry about it. The fact that he was too old to be a father at the age of 100 and that Sarah, his wife, was 90 was also... She was too old to have a baby. Can you imagine? Now, you women in here. I don't know what's like because I can't have any kids. But you women that have had kids. Can you imagine doing that at 90? No. No. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <walking>. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah here, she knows. She knows what it's like. 90 years old, having a baby. Abraham never doubted. He believed God for his faith and trust. His trust even grew stronger. When you trust in God and believe in God that it, when it doesn't look right, when I don't understand it, don't you know the only thing that does is fuel the fire for a stronger faith and motivate you for the bigger things? Right? It's a great statement. Why? Why? And I'm writing this down. But here's the thing. If we can believe God in faith for these small things over here, then all of a sudden the next thing comes up. The next thing comes up. Right. Then when the major storms come, guess what? I don't have to worry. God, you said that you're the same God of yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. And if your power, your grace, your anointing, God, if your mercy doesn't change, if your weight doesn't change, if your power don't change, then I don't care if it's a toenail or if it's a surgery. I don't care. If it's a blood condition or cancer, I don't care if it's financial, I don't care if it's a husband, wife, how big it is. God, you're the same God today that you was yesterday. If you can do it then, you can do it today. And all I need to do is be patient and stand in the balance while you rewrite my story and my circumstance. If that's you, pop your hands up. That's the key. Yes. You can murmur, complain, or you can rewrite the narrative. <laughs> you can write the story. How do I do that? It's your choice. It's your choice. Right? I 
get it. I've been there. Yeah, I do. So does God. I've laid flat on my back. I've been on life support. I know what it's like to face surgeries that you don't know if you're going to live or die. I know, I've been there. Right? But I could have just laid there and said, 50 50 shot. Or the reason I've got the authority to preach something like that is because I've had to do it. Right? Why? I can say, God, it's like nothing but a common cold. That's right. Amen. That's right. You know? Mm -hmm. And if you did it for her, you did it for her. God, I've stood up there and I've preached on how Kay got healed of cancer. I, I preach to others, their healings and stuff. I, I, I've stood on this stuff. If you can do it for them. Absolutely. Amen. If you can change their story. That's right. You can do it for me. That's right. And then all of a sudden, guess what I do? I get this spiritual mentality, Jerry. God's, I, you said you were no respecter of persons. Amen. Amen. That's right. Right? If you can do it for Abraham and Sarah, you could do it for me. Amen. If you can heal Barnabas, you can heal me. If you can open blinded eyes, you can heal me. Amen. Abraham was old. Zacchaeus was short. Mary was a word. Martha was a gossiper. Right? Noah was Noah. <laughs> David <laughs> was ever <laughs> was everything but and <laughs> right. <coughs> I got another one. You ready for this? Lazarus was dead. If you can still use all those people with all those imperfections, all those sicknesses, all those sins, right, you can use me. That's right. Right? Amen. Did you get this tonight? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Rewrite my story. When you make these ways, these ones I gave you, these three ways to rewrite your story, regular habits, your life, Will change. Right? If you take the steps to become quick to believe, to respond, to repent, to forgive, expect a major plot twist in your future. Amen. Understand that? God has already penned and planned the story of your life. Amen. What is it? It's a story of victory. It's not a story of defeat and despair. Amen. It's a story of victory. Amen. Right? So take the time to pin the future that he has in store for you. Why? Why do you want to say that, Pastor? Because your life will become the greatest glory story you could ever imagine. And nobody can do it but you. Nobody can tell your story but you. Here's what I implore upon you today. Make a decision tonight on Sunday night here at GBC to start taking on these three keys that I gave you here tonight to rewrite your story, and you will experience a transformation in your relationship with God this summer. If we start right here tonight, by the time the kids go back three months, summer, you'll see an all-out difference in GBC. Yes. I feel impressed today. I told you about this summer, by the end of summer. So call me on it. You have that right. But you gotta do your part. Amen. Amen. Yes. You can't call me on something that you ain't gonna do. Amen. Right? Amen. right? Yep. Amen. There you go. Are you blessed? Yes. Did you get something out of that? Yes. It's good to be back. Amen. Did you miss me? Thank you all. Yeah. I you too. <laughs> I don't know how many times your phone go off. 
Didn't you get the things? I planned the video. Are you happy in God? Amen. You blessed and highly favored? Amen. Are some of you awake? Yes. Amen. You awake? All right. That's good to know. You awake? You see what I deal with? I might have to get the bottle off. You are. I've been waiting on that. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the word that has come alive today within this house, in both services today. A clarion call, God, to this church, specifically to this people. God, about our attitude of worship and praise. Father, and also how we can rewrite our story. How the narrative can be changed. Though the world and the church and everybody else may say it's impossible, you said, I am the author and finisher. Yes. So, Father, we thank you for that. And, Father, as they leave this house and go to their respective places, we ask your hand of mercy to be upon them until we return here or we return in the air. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Be blessed.